Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about all things Beatles, any part of their past, and anything going on in the news today. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other Beatles program syndicated around the world called The Beatles Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other co-hosts. First of all, we have uh, the writer for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also from Beatle Fan Magazine, who's been with them since the very beginning, writer Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also one of the writers for Beatle Fan and musicologist and freelance writer, Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. On the program this time, we have a special guest who's actually been on our show a couple times before. Back in the days, long ago, when it was just Steve and me uh, co-hosting the show. It's Charles Rosney. He is the event organizer behind Danbury Fields Forever, which is a one-day all-Beatles music festival happening in Danbury, Connecticut at the Charles Ives Center, happening on August the 15th. And he's here to talk about that and maybe some other activities that he's involved with, Beatle-wise. Let's welcome Charles Rosnay to the show. Hey, Ken. Hi, guys. Hey, hey Charles. Hey, Charles. So glad we can all be together in this lovely, quite, quite this abode. palatial studio. <laughs> you know, I've always been very close to Charles, but never this close. <laughs> because uh, we are doing this <laughs> partly... In my own studio, which is, it's very cramped in here. It's a very small studio. And we're both sharing the same microphone, so. And the same headphones. But no, no don't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about Danbury Fields to start. And why don't we just uh, tell the folks what Danbury Fields is and how it all got started and, and what, people can, what uh, people can hope to see. At well, Danbury Fields. It's the fourth year of this uh, Beatles Music Festival, and it's uh, pretty special because the date we selected to have the event, August 15th, as um, aficionados will know, was the, is the exact to the date 50 years that um, the Beatles played their first historic concert at Shea Stadium. So we're um, you know commemorating that event with a whole day of uh, festivities, honoring and, and, and you know, playing around the Beatles, including 11 bands, special guests, uh, vendors and uh, food trucks and, and all kind of great things that, you know, constitute a festival with the Beatles theme. Mm -hmm. What made you want to do this kind of thing after so many years of doing Beatle conventions? Well, the conventions I did for many years and um, loved doing the conventions. I mean, I think those were, you know, the, the the being able to get people like Pete Best and Cynthia Lennon and Julia Bear, John Lennon's sister, so many guests, and be the first one to get a lot of the guests was a real, you know, feather in my cap and very, always proud to be friends of all those guests. But I think the guests ran dry. And, uh, you know, unless you can get a George Martin or you can get a Julian Lennon, you know, there were not a lot of really mass appeal guests left. And I always used to say, you know, when people ask why the Beatles, I would say it's the three M's. It's the music, you know, the magic, the memories, and the magic, of course, is that X factor, which you can't put your finger on, the memories for those who uh, lived through it and those, you know, who may have lived through it through their, you know, um, brothers or sisters or parents or grandparents, mm -hmm. and also the music. But the music was always first and foremost. And, you know, having brought people to Liverpool for over 30 years where there's a Matthew Street Beatles festival right. and seeing how the music means everything, it just made sense to really transition everything over to a music festival. And, and it's worked and it's been great. Okay. Now, Steve and I, uh, as I said, we've had you on the show a couple of times. I think we'll make some room here for Al and Alan to ask you some questions because I'm sure they have loads of questions to ask to ask you. Uh, we'll start with uh, Alan. Well, you know, it's uh, it's kind of an unusual kind of program that you have. And I think the, the fact that, uh, you know, looking on the website, the fact that it's outdoors, I think, is a little, a little different from um, the way this kind of thing normally is. You know, when I say this kind of thing, I mean, you know, conventions and festivals and and things. Um, what, what, what is the appeal of the outdoor setting for you? Yeah, so it's 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 been successful in Liverpool, very successful for Abbey Road on the river. That's true. And 
what what it does is it gives people the opportunity to to really walk around they're not trapped you know in a ballroom they're not under four walls a beautiful day i mean they can walk if they if a band's on for a half hour then there's a 15 minute break another band goes on if they don't want to hear the early beatles they know it, it two two bands from then there's going to be classic you know latter year beatles mm -hmm. if they want to hear solo they they're going to hear a whole gamut of music but if they want to take a break, they can go over to have pizza and they can have ices and they can have, you know, one of 20 different, you know, food options that are going to be there. They could visit the artists that are there, like Shannon. They could visit the authors that are going to be there. It's very much like a convention, except the focus isn't really on the memorabilia, on the guests. That's all really plays in second part to the, you know, the many bands that many artists and many uh, solo acts that are performing. Last year we did two days and had over 20 artists. This year we scaled it back to one day in our fourth year. It's a one day show, but there's 11 different artists r ranging from uh, y younger bands who are, um, you know, doing their favorite Beatles music in heavy metal style to uh, R&B solo singers who are doing it and belting it out, you know, soul style. So it's a, a really it's all about the, it's all about the music, Alan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really also sort of like you know a, a fair, you know, like a nice day out, and you hear the music, and the theme is just the Beatles. You know, it's the, that it's the that's what ties it together as a, a thematic theme, but it's a thematic theme. <laughs> But, you know, no, you're uh, right. It's absolutely right. There's there's something called Gathering of the Vibes, which takes place in hmm. Connecticut, you know, the week or two before us. And it's a Grateful Dead themed festival. Well, there's reggae festivals, there's Latin festivals, there's all these themed festivals. And what it, it really I think what it does is it brings out a lot more of the generations to have fun. Mm -hmm. You can sit in a seat or you can lay out on the lawn and have a picnic while you're there. The, just the, the atmosphere and the vibe is just so different. It's just really a cooler, chill vibe. Mm -hmm. Are there memorabilia dealers as well? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. Yep. There's just a handful because we don't you know, really overemphasize that. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of memorabilia um, dealers, a handful of record and, and CD dealers. And then there's artisans and there's a hula hoop exhibit and there's face painting. So it, it really meshes well. And it's that new kind of concept that goes beyond the convention, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sounds like fun. Nothing, okay. Nothing's as great as a convention. You know, if you're a true fan, you get the best of every world with that. Here, I think it's more laid back. It's more family friendly. It's more um, let's have a picnic. Let's have a festival. Let's go to the fair and hear tons of Beatles music. Mm hmm. So okay. Charles, give us uh, give us an idea of some of the bands that will be appearing, and also you mentioned that there are going to be some guests. Yeah, so uh, I'll start with the, with the guests because last year, of course, for the 50th anniversary of the Beatles and the British Invasion, we wanted to pull in something a little different, and we got a gentleman who had never done any uh, personal appearances in the States for I don't know how long. It was Carl Green, who was the bass player for Herman's Hermits, mm -hmm. the original founding member and bass player, and he came by, but he only stayed for you know like an hour, signed autographs, pretty much sold CDs and left. This year we thought, well, it's the, you know, 50th anniversary of Shea, but let's stick with that British invasion, uh, theme. And, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Hilton Valentine who lives mm -hmm, in Connecticut. Sure. Happens to be the, you know, the original lead guitarist of the Animals, mm -hmm. uh, is a rock and roll hall of famer. And of course, there's the Animals who were the first British invasion band to have a number one hit after the Beatles. So there's that great connection. Well, he's not just coming for an hour. He's coming the whole day and he's going to meet fans and talk about the 60s and the Beatles and the British invasion and the animals and all that stuff, but also sign autographs and sell CDs. And we just found out he's going to, you know, perform a few songs with the bands. Now the bands, I think he's going to be performing with the Blue Meanies who are well known sure. in New Jersey and all over the East Coast yeah. because they do Beatle tributes, monkey tributes, uh, the, the Beach Kinks. Boys, Kings. Yeah, yeah, they're a real great 60s band. For this show, they're doing all 1965. They're doing the Help album plus other 65 chestnuts. The Hoffners, who are the other headliners, are a Connecticut band, and they're doing the whole Shea Stadium set in the Shea outfits. So those are the two headliners. Then we've got a band from Long Island called Penny Lane, who are uh, doing the Pepper outfits and doing the Pepper uh, Magical Mystery Tour era. 
We've got a group called Number Nine who do a lot of obscure deep cuts. They're a six, seven piece ensemble. They fashion themselves like the Fab Faux. They don't try to look the part, but they sound great. And then there's a female led band called the Navels who, uh, when they're not doing a Beatles <laughs> tribute, actually do Stevie Nicks tribute. So it's, it's really amazing stuff. We've got a group called, um, the Strictly Beatles and, uh, they're doing, um, B sides. We've got School of Rock coming in, and those are the you know best students of the School sure. of Rock school, yeah. and they're doing like the heavier stuff. Yeah. They're doing the Come Together, uh, Abbey Road, you know, heavier stuff. We've got Nikita Waller, who's that female R and B soul singer I told you about. <laughs> We've got um, a guy named Eric Herps from a Connecticut new wave sort of uh, rocking original band called Dizzy Fish. And then we have Ken's two favorite bands, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because they're really amazing when it comes to solo material. It's the Onos from Massachusetts and After Fab, also from New England, and uh, they really go deep into the Beatles solo material, and it really adds, it fills the whole gamut of you know adding every bit of the Beatles from early years through later years through solo years. Mm -hmm. Right, sounds good. That's the one thing that I appreciate the most because, you know, you get a taste of all the different bands from our area and you decide which ones you like the most and maybe you end up following them. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a site that I look up. There's a Facebook page called uh, Beatles Tribute Fans that I go to, which lists uh, tribute groups from around the world and where they're playing. And I use that so that I can report which ones are playing in New England. Oh, wow. So there are certain ones like Penny Lane I've heard about for quite a while but never got to see yes. from Long Island. and. Some of the bands I've heard about mainly through you and from Danbury Fields. And After Fab is a wonderful band playing just solo music. They're strictly solo. And the Onos mix up the group with uh, the solo music. There's all different types of bands. There's even some that, uh, as you like to call them, they're suits and boots right. bands. Who will dress the part, wear the wig sure. and the hat. And then, and then there's the others who, you know, really it's all about, again, all about the music for them. They don't care if they're exactly, you know, have the, the, the Vox and they, that they don't need the McCartney, you know, Hofner bass, but they, you know, capture the sound perfectly or their derivations of it. You know, some of the bands just change it up and make it, you know, uh, take a, their unique, um, style of, of their normal playing and just do Beatles songs to their own style. So it really is a so someone who wants to spend a day and get the full gamut. If you, the doors open at noon, they close at eight o'clock during that time during that period of eleven acts. They're really getting a whole wide variety, the whole color spectrum of the Beatles catalog. Yeah, I love that aspect too. When bands do their own arrangements, certain bands do that. What was the heavy metal band kind of from last year? Oh, genetic, genetic control. control. We had them for a few years, and they were very popular. This, this is a fact, actually the bands that we had the first three years in a row. Even though we love them, there's them and Fools on the Hill. We just decided to mix it up because there were so many bands vying for slots and vying right. for you know to do a set. And like Penny Lane from Long Island never had a chance to use them before. The Blue Meanies never had a chance to use them before. Right. So we brought back a few and then brought in a, a whole lot of new ones. Yeah. Steve, you got a question? Yeah, uh, Charles. I mean, you've been doing the, you've been doing between the conventions and everything. You've been doing this for quite a while. How has the the dynamic of the, of fans evolved over time? I mean, you're also you're talking a demographic number one, but I mean, just the whole the whole issue of who attends these things. Um, yeah, I, I, I realize. I was gonna say, I realize you're you're kind of going for families now, but I mean, just in general, how does it How's it go? Well, I've always been a proponent of uh, spreading the gospel and keeping the spirit alive as much as possible. And I've always tried to make everything I do very family friendly um, and, and try to encourage new generations. You know, who knows if, if a fan comes and, you know, here's the a Beatle band for the first time that, you know, we're not winning over new fans. I'm, you know, I'm not a Beatle, and I'm not. It's not something that I don't know if they want to be done. I'm sure they would to perpetuate it, but I've always wanted that to be the case. But the best way I can assess what you're asking is through our tours. I mean, you know, we do the tours to London and Liverpool every summer. We've been doing those over 30 years, and the, the magical history tours that we do. 
obviously the demographic has gotten older when it was 30s and 40s you know a couple of years ago it's people in their 50s and 60s and it's it's something that i hear the term more often it's the bucket list we want to go on your tour we've always wanted to we had to wait till we retired and now we're going hmm. um but it, even in those cases it's parents bringing their kids it's grandparents bringing their kids and their kids so i just love the fact that it's multi-generational and i think that's how it's changed you know when when we started I, I started my first Beatles convention in 78 you know a couple of years after Joe Pope and Mark Lapidus before just right after they did and um it was a lot of teenagers a lot of college kids a lot of people in their 20s and 30s and and you know the Beatles were all individually with us there was always still a chance they would reunite there was always still the chance that they were going to live forever you know that's changed and as it's changed i think you know the 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 realities of collecting have also changed and the realities of you know who's going to come to an event you know we would always say um who knows we sent an invitation to paul and to john they might show up of course they were never going to show up but you know there was always that one in a zillion chance that somehow they would you know just do something goofy and show up in new haven connecticut for a convention or something mm. like that <laughs> but um Having said all that, I guess it's just the demographic has aged a bit. And in, in that, we hope that they've passed it down, you know, to the other generations, to their children and grandchildren and younger siblings, and that they'll be, you know, I remember, uh, you know, a few years into the conventions, people would say, and it's what they probably asked Paul, when will the bubble burst? You know, mm. the famous video clip. And uh, they asked me, why, you know, is this going to you know, go on a few years and I go, well, why not? It's, you know, it's the seventies and eighties. Now it's gone on 10, 20 years. Why wouldn't it go 30 or 40 years? And it's gone 50 years and it's amazing. And I hope it just still goes on because it brings me such joy when I bring someone to Liverpool and they're walking into the cavern for the first time, or they're seeing Penny Lane or Strawberry Fields, or they come to a, an event like this and they come over and say, Charles, I'm so glad you had it. My, you know, my, my grandson loved the Beatle music and loved the whole atmosphere. And that's what it's all about. It's just the joy that it brings to the others who are part of the event. Mm. And since you're bringing up the, the Magical History Tours, let's just make a departure to that for a while. We'll go back to... Uh, Danbury Fields in a bit. But in addition to all the incredible sights that you've shown in, in Liverpool and London, mm -hmm. you've had other trips. And, and this particular year, you're going to Hamburg. Yeah. You've also been to Scotland. Scotland, as Amsterdam, well. right. Right. What have been the most special for you, looking back all these years to those incredible locations, histor historic locations? Interestingly enough, most of the surprise and the best things weren't planned. It was, uh, you know, going to London and finding out that Julian was doing a, a signing at, at a toy store right. and going to meet him and getting his autograph and hanging out with him. It was, um, you know, on certain shows we would go to uh, when when we, we do the August trip every single year. But then we would also do trips to see McCartney and we do trips to see mm. Ringo. You know, we would do all those tours. And, um, you know, you never knew who you would meet. That was always, for me, the the great thing. And and sadly, so many are gone. Right. You know, yeah. Uncle Charles Lennon, uh, dad, uh, Ringo's stepdad, Harry. Um, you can go down the list of, of people like Alf Bicknell and, um, and now, Alistair Taylor and Bob Wooler. Yeah. And and the timing, yeah, I was just going to say, and now we've lost Scylla. So there's just so many people who we had the great fortune of meeting and, you know, hanging out with. I mean, one of my personal best memories, and God rest her soul, we went for the first time to the Casbah. And Pete opened his house to the fans for the first time. And we met his brothers, uh, Rory and Rogue. But Mona said, you guys are going to stay. You're going to be my guests. She made it a party. She put on music. She danced oh with us. Huh. She fed us. That was really probably one of my highlights. You know, Pete Best, uh, we became friends, you know, from that day on. And he came to a lot of my conventions and was a real was a real great person. But um, that was pretty much the catalyst of the whole bringing people over to Liverpool was meeting wow. them there and then bringing them to the conventions here. But the Mona dancing was one of my great memories. Wow. Mm. Do you have a Scylla story, Charles? I don't have a Scylla story at all. We, you know, she was uh, as much as the, she was tightly connected to the Beatles. She was purely London and purely television and purely, you know, BBC and all that. 
I, there were times that she was invited to come to the convention, and it was always one of those things she said she would eventually get to, the Liverpool convention, and, and sadly never made it. Um, but the, the, she was so loved in Liverpool, and everybody you know who was ever had anything to do with her, be it Alan Williams in the early days or any of the people who were tied in with the Cavern, uh, the Cavern's original doorman, Patty Delaney, they all always had the greatest things to say about Scylla Black, who, of course, became Scylla uh, a Scylla White who became Scylla Black. Mm-hmm. There, I just published some pictures this morning. I mean, Liverpool is, is just a wash in, in tributes. There's just, uh, I mean, from the cavern to they've got the flags flying at half staff over there. It's, it's pretty amazing. Well, so. she went beyond the Beatles. You know, she went beyond the cavern. She became, you know, a countrywide well-known celebrity mm-hmm. you know, she was she right. was I, I don't want to go as far as to say she was the oprah of england but she was certainly of that ilk maybe a barbara walters level level celebrity that's a good that's a good turn that's a good point um yeah uh, i think uh, that uh, that gets up there with with what she was doing yeah i mean she was just so so much a part of their culture it was great it was really good but that can- she had go ahead I'm sorry. No, you no, you had asked what was my personal. I think for the fans, every every few years we we're just lucky and fortuitous, and its timing works out that we're able to get not just to Abbey Road and to write on the wall and to cross the street, but we've been blessed to get inside an actual recording session at Abbey Road Studios, and that's pretty much that. That's the highlight of the trip when we can pull that off. And we unfortunately we can't pull it off many years because there's a lot of times that the London Symphony Orchestra or Elton John or Paul or whoever have the studio blocked for months on end, mm. um, and we can't get it get near getting inside. But the times we did, that was probably a highlight for the people who've gone multiple times. As you guys know, you know we've been doing it over 30 years, the tour to, to Liverpool and London, and there's people who've gone like 20 times <laughs> who've gone because every year there's something different. They're going to either meet someone new or we go to different places that we hadn't gone to before. And uh, we we have to keep it fresh and have to continue to do different things for those who come back from year to year to year. Well, I have a feeling that there's one that probably stands out one tour that stands out more than any of the others. And that would probably be 1983. Right. Cause, of course. Yeah. Cause it was my first. <laughs> well, that would happen also. And you can fill up the blanks up. there. Tell me what now, cause it wasn't why? that the year that for the first time they opened up studio two and had that. Ah, so, right. So two things, that was the first year they opened up studio two and I guess because I've been there, you know, uh, several times after the first one should be my most memorable. But my best memory of A3, and you won't believe this, uh-huh. the cavern had not been rebuilt yet. It had not been restructed. They they had. It, I walked down Matthew Street, and it was like walking down a scary alley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there was no, uh, you know, there were no Beatles shops, uh-huh. and there was no, you know. Uh, club on every on every inch playing Beatles music Mm -hmm. but all the buildings were boarded over and and scaffolded and really it was like you're walking through tenement slums and I remember the people I was with Tom Frangione myself all Tom King and real true Beatle fans put our ears to the walls and just imagine Mm -hmm. and that was pretty special because you know we were just imagining Love of the Love coming out of there, or or you know, or uh, early just live Hamburg like sounds emanating from the cavern, and we walked away. People must have thought we were like all drunk, or which is not a big deal <laughs> there, but they must have thought we were uh, you know really flying high because we were walking away just smiling because we had you know experienced something internally that no one else probably did unless they were there at that time, which was. After the original cavern was gone, mm-hmm. and before the new cavern was built, so it's a pretty that's weird a, time for us. Yeah, that's a that's a great story. That's a great story. Not to go far off track, but Charles, when when we met in Vegas uh, for that McCartney show at the Joint, that was pretty awesome. That that show was just. I mean, he was like in everybody's face. It was it, that was amazing. So I saw Paul in Birmingham in um, Ma- um, in England, and that was at the NEC, and it was the first time I met him. So that's my favorite concert experience. But as far as a pure show, being close, 
perfection. It was what you. It was the joint in Las Vegas. Mm. Anyone who was there will say, even if you saw twenty McCartney shows, that was the one. Hmm. Yeah, that Steve was, is that Steve was, is always raving about it. You know. Yeah, that That's was. That, Steve, you and I got to hang together. That's why it was did. great. <laughs> we did. We did. We uh, we were right in the middle of that small little room and got our ears blasted out, especially when he did live and die. It was like, it was incredible. It was, uh, and, and I'm really, you know, I, I've, I've asked why they don't release that thing. I mean, that is got to be one of his, you know, that, that show is just so astounding. And, 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 he, and the, YouTube, the, the YouTube videos don't do it justice. They really, really don't. Not even close. Is it really a question of the performance or is it just that it was, so intimate. That's a good question. Um, I bet it was because it was so intimate. There's no place I think in that venue where you're more than 400 feet from the artist. Right. And he did. And like so, I said, he uh, did let he did live and, live and let die. So I mean, yeah. And that was loud. That was. And I didn't bring. I don't know about you, Charles, but I didn't have ear earplugs. And <laughs> I, I, I felt that one for a couple of days. I remember. Now, but, didn't you see? Didn't you see Paul in Liverpool live? Yep. A few what times, was that right? experience like? Well, that's different because you know that he's always a little more uh, emotional about mm. that. I mean, the first one of the times is when he did that Give Peace a Chance medley. Right. And he always does something special. When he's in Liverpool, most of the time he's also going to Lippa and uh, visiting the students. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, we're kind of camping out most of the days of his concert at the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, and we always get, you know, a close encounter. It's either a wave or a photo or a, photo or a hey, gang, you know, hey, Paul. But the, his concerts there, yeah, I mean, there's so many memorable shows, you know, at the Ed Sullivan Theater, right. at, at, at Shea, you know, at City Field. There's, there's just every one, and you got to hand it to him because he tries to play – you know, different venues that he hasn't played and he tries to, um, you know, break new ground with, with the locations he picks. So, but the joint, there was something definitely magical about that. And it was probably the intimacy of the event. Yeah. In fact, Alan had talked about, and, and I was there too at the Ed Sullivan theater for up close. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we both got to witness that. Was that there. was just so special. That, that was, was around great. the off the ground time. Yep. Yeah, that it was, was great. A snowy, uh, snowy day, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And uh, we had to brave the elements to make it from our respective areas to get to the Sullivan Theater, but that was worth it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, Alan, you have a, a question? So, <laughs> looking <laughs> looking forward, you know, to to you know, you've you've now sort of hit on a. Um, uh, an approach to doing these uh, the the summer outdoor things and 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 also your your travel things. Do you have anything um, different planned in the future? Do you have any any sort of changes that you're contemplating for either? Well, I'd of those? like to do. Yeah, you know, we rebranded the Danbury Fields Forever event. Well, it's it's obvious why it's called that. It's in Danbury, Connecticut, and it's a play on Strawberry Fields Forever. Mm -hmm. um, but we. We've been rebranding it for the Fab Four Music Festival in the hopes that we could do it, you know, in maybe other places, maybe in a Philly or a Boston or a market that, you know, we can get a producer to perhaps package it and we bring the same, you know, theme to another place. I'd love to do that. We're also going to continue the Beatle tours, obviously. Those are going to go on, God willing, another 30, 40, 50 years. <laughs> Why not, right? Uh, and... uh what we did in 2010, and this is a very local event, we did a tribute to John Lennon. We called it Remember uh, Lennon Imagine 70 because it was his 70th birthday in 2010. Mm -hmm. And we had the event right on October 9th. And this year we're doing the same thing. On October 9th we're doing uh, Remember Lennon Imagine 75. Mm -hmm. And we get a great John Lennon tribute artist and do a, a concert of what might have been. It's John, if, if he actually ever did tour, what it would have been like mm. from this perspective of this artist. And that's um, in New Haven at a place called the College Street Music Hall on October 9th. But looking ahead, I, I guess sticking with the same things and hopefully always making them better and giving more avenues for you know fans to enjoy uh, the music the way you know the way others have in, in the past. Mm -hmm. Al? Matter of fact, I think you've got a pretty short turnaround between Danbury Fields Forever and your next tour, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> well, normally we have the event in July, right. and it gives me, you know, a month or a month and a half before the, the Liverpool trip, before the Magical History Tour. This year, we're talking about one week oh, boy. when the event ends <laughs> to when we go uh, on the 22nd. We're going to Hamburg first, as Ken mentioned. Then we're going to London. Then we're going to Liverpool. So August is uh, definitely between these interviews and between those events. It's definitely, uh, you know, Beatle month for me. And it's real. It's Beatle week in Liverpool. Some people say, well, why do you go in August? Why don't you go another time a year? That's when the the city of Liverpool really yeah. embraces the Beatles and embraces the Tens upon ten thousands of fans who come, you know, from all over the world, not just the U.S. I mean, people are coming from every nation, and there's a 150, 200 bands from all countries who come together in Liverpool. So that's when we do it, and uh, yeah, it's not not allowing a lot of time in between to breathe, but it'll give me enough time to pack anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How long have the Beatle conventions, the week-long ones, been running now in Liverpool? Uh, since '85. Okay. There were tiny ones before that. Uh, the Mersey Beetle. Um, yeah. They were done by Jim and Liz Hughes, uh -huh. and they were very small mm. and very intimate. But um, when Cavern City Tours took them over, that's really when uh, the whole city, and from there it became the Beetle story developed, and all this really great things in Liverpool really, you know, came about, and and they they really took to tourism. Before that, it was like. Uh, you talk, talk to a scouser on the street, and I'm not going to do the accent because I wouldn't do it justice, but he would say, the Beatles left us. We don't want the Beatle fans here. And, you know, this was these 90-year-old geezers who were the, <laughs> the, 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 the actual Liverpool. That was the consensus of so many of the people there, hmm. and that was turned around. They westernized real quickly when they realized, you know, the, how many uh, dollars can be spent and how many lira and how many yen. Uh, <laughs> For Beatle fans, and and it's good it is because it gives us such a great uh, platform for for attending. in the In the first year or two, in eighty three and eighty four, I mean, we did a lot of research, but we had to find the Iron Rail, we had to find the Casbah, we had to find you know all these clubs where the Beatles played in their homes. And now you know we lay it out, we make the fans' job. There's no job. We take them to every possible place. And it's just, you know, it's it's like on a silver platter handed out and they're able to go to the places that they really couldn't get to on their own, but have always dreamed about going. They've seen the pictures in the postcards, seen them in the books and, you know, and heard about them in the songs. And we, we, we bring it to life in the trip. When you do yeah. when you do the tours, I'm just curious, uh, especially in Liverpool and London, do you uh, sort of incorporate with people like Richard Porter in London and Jackie Snyder, uh, Jackie Spencer, excuse me, in Liverpool. Well, yeah, that's a good question. So Richard Porter, we did for many years, mm -hmm. and uh, Renee Van Harlem from Beatles Unlimited now runs the London one, right. and it's no slight to Richard. We love Richard, Renee. Uh, it just gets to more places, and you know, fits in more in the schedule. Um, we might use Richard again in the future for Liverpool. We, we, I think Jackie did early trips, but we would mix it up. Some years, uh, John's sister, Julia Baird would take mm -hmm. us on trips. Um, we would go for the celebrity, uh, tour guide and in fact the past few years and we're using them again this year it's david bedford oh the sure. author of Lydia, oh, yeah. of Lydia. Yeah. so again jackie spencer's great i would like to think david bedford's a little different i'm mm -hmm. not going to say better because i don't mm -hmm. want to put down but yeah you know there's a lot of tour guides to choose from um we try to go with the best possible one to give the fans uh, the best possible experience for two reasons. Again, the ones who are repeating it, we want them to to find places they've never been to. But the ones who are going first time, this might be the only time they're ever going to go to Liverpool. It might be the only time they'll be out of the country. We want to make sure it's the most comprehensive, most complete, most enjoyable trip they're on. You know, everything I do with with the tours, uh, I try to mix the educational, the informative. But fun, you know, on the bus, we're showing Beatle videos, we're doing trivia, we're having sing-alongs. I try to, you know, make it so personable and fun that they're going to go home and say, oh my God, this was the best trip I've ever been on. I couldn't be happier. And one of the uh, the sidebars to all these tours is 
people who go on the trip, and Ken could attest to this, stay friends for years thereafter. I mean, they become lifelong friends mm -hmm. right. because they've just shared, you know, a, a, a trip where where it's shared. It's a shared love of the Beatles. Yeah, some of my wife's closest friends are the ones that went on your trip right. back in uh, 91 or 92, I think it was. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's a great choice to have David Bedford help you out. He's, he's done great. sensational work with his books. And he's not only a huge Beatle fan, but he's Liverpudlian through and through and proud of it. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Hamburg and the times you've been to Hamburg and what that experience has been like. So when you think Hamburg, you think of uh, four clubs. Mm -hmm. You think of uh, Star Club, Kaiser Keller, Indra, and the Top Ten Club. Would you believe three of those clubs still stand? The Top Ten has changed its name many times. The Kaiser Keller is like one of the top discos in Hamburg. And the Indra Club is exactly as it was, and we have a party there when we go. Uh, we bring wow. in a Beatles band, and we recreate what it might have been like when the Beatles played at the Indra. And then we do uh, we really walk in the footsteps of the Beatles. We go to all the places they, they visited, all the places they played, the site of the Bambikino uh, that burnt down because of the Beatles, supposedly. Um, <laughs> but we also, um, what, what's really wonderful is we spend our time staying at a hotel right in the St. Pauli district. So we're in the heart of the Reaper Bond, which is still a red light district, which is still the most colorful underground red light district probably in the world, maybe that in Amsterdam. And uh, so we're right in the hub of where the Beatles stayed and lived and breathed, those savage young Beatles before they became famous and Brian cleaned them up. Um, and that's really a great, you know, beginning. This is, Whereas that was the prelude to the Beatles, you know, coming back to Liverpool and then conquering London and the rest of the world. We pretty much do that in that we do Hamburg first, mm -hmm. and then we go to London, and then we sneak into Henley, and we spend some time in George's hometown, uh, Henley on Thames, and then we go to Liverpool for an entire week. So it's really a, a complete, complete experience. It's jam packed. <laughs> There's so much to do in that. In uh, it's, it's two weeks long. Is it's it? uh, twelve days. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to ask a question for Charles? I, I got to ask these guys. Have you been? Have you been to Liverpool, Alan, Al, and Steve? Uh, yes, uh, I have. Eight. eight uh, it's been a while. It was '89. That's the only time I was out over there. Wow. I have, I have to say no. I have really. Not been. Mm. I have not been. You should go. It's interesting. Yeah, it is. I know. <laughs> people keep tell, people keep saying that to me, and. Uh, you know. Steve, go to liverpooltours.com. You'll find uh, <laughs> all the information you need. <laughs> okay. And I went I went in 91, but it wasn't your trip. Mm -hmm. I have to make it one of your trips. Right. But, uh, yeah, I didn't spend enough time in Liverpool. I spent more time in London, actually. But, uh, no, I definitely want to go back. I can't wait to go back. I went Great. in 91 and 99. Uh, 91 for the Liverpool Oratorio. Um, mm -hmm. although I got actually a, uh, a, a quick tour of the place, um, with Mark Lewis and, um, driving around in his car and pointing out, you know, okay, uh, the Beatles played in that building on September 3rd, 1962 <laughs> at 3.05 PM. <laughs> he is, okay. Uh, that's good, Mark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and then, uh, in 99 was for the, the cavern show. And, and again, I went with Mark and, uh, that was actually all fun. Although, you know, since I think he was at the time probably either still working for a club sandwich or somehow still close to them. So I just went to the concert, which I was covering for the times and he went off and partied with them afterwards. So, uh, uh, I didn't get to go do that because, you know, you didn't go during Beatle week, but I think you had uh, two primo <laughs> experiences yeah, between the oratorio sure. and were, Paul's Cavern. Yeah. You know, I have yeah. to say the the day of the Cavern show, it was really kind of interesting because we're walking up Matthew Street. And of course, it's completely different than the boarded up place you described from the, the earlier time you went. Right. Um, and now it is Beatle shops all over the place. But besides Beatle shops all over the place, you're walking down Matthew Street in the middle of the afternoon, the day of this this cavern club concert and you know oh there's alan williams walking past and there's right. someone, and you know you feel sort of like you're in a live action version of yellow submarine or something you know where you just sort of recognize <laughs> everyone walking past you it was very interesting and you see the grapes and you see all the places of course yeah you sure alan was you sure alan was walking by he wasn't stumbling by well he was <laughs> sort of floating by and uh 
<laughs> floating by, yeah. And there was you. God bless him. He's out, he's outlasted a lot of his uh, contemporaries. Sure. You know, we've still true. got Bill Harry. We still have Sam Leach, and we still have Alan Williams. Yeah. yeah. How is Sam doing? Because he had a, he took a fall recently, so, didn't he? Sam took a fall at the previous uh, Liverpool Beatles convention and broke a hip, and he's uh, thank God recuperating very nicely. You know. Hmm. Yep. He yeah. fell. He fell behind a dealer's table on one of the, over one of the uh, table extenders, Ooh. and uh, yeah, we had to be rushed to the hospital. It's too bad because he he looks forward to the conventions. He gets to see old friends, meet fans, sign autographs. It's too bad when some of them who um, you know Charlie Lennon I think stayed alive a lot longer because he couldn't wait till August when the Beatle mm. fans would come over. Yeah. There was this beautiful old gal named Margaret who lived in one of Ringo's homes. And she would just delight when Beatle fans would come and knock on her door. And they, she'd let them in the house and say, well, I'm a biggest, bigger Elvis fan than I am a Beatles fan, but come look in where Ringo's apartment was, you know? Yeah. And she just passed last year, unfortunately. Mm. But I think, you know, she lived till about 112. And <laughs> I think she got another 20 years out of the fact that she was able to make Beatle fans happy. <laughs> wow. From what I understand, at those, at those Beatle conventions in Liverpool, you do have a lot of family members of the Beatles wandering around, kind of unannounced. Yeah, uh, Brian Epstein's family members would come. Uh, you would have members of, of the Beatles' families. And, y you know, uh, what's really great about Liverpool, aside from that, is someone in, in uh, Alan, you know, said he saw Alan Williams on the street. Alan just comes to the convention. Bob Buller would just come to the convention and like, you know, like you and me, just hang out, visit the exhibitors, even when they weren't planned guests. Sam Leach used to just come to the conventions. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they're in town and, you know, that's what they did. Now some of them, like Pete Best Family, you know, they have the best fest during that time. So they really gear uh, all their activities around the tourists coming to visit. So there's some that wouldn't now, you know, stop by as they would. Mark Lewison will come when he has, you know, a new book and he's an invited guest. Mm -hmm. um, but Julia's there, Ju you know, Julia's there every single year and she meets fans and she couldn't be more personable. It's really great. It's really great that the people of Liverpool, it took them a few years, but really embraced the whole Beatledom and, and it's, it's its own cottage industry there now, but in a good way, only in a good way. Would you say the conventions in Liverpool have gotten bigger and bigger still? The, the Beatle week has. Um, now the Beatles convention is just one part of it. And then there's a, a, there's a mini Beatles flea market at another hotel the day before. And then there's the music festival that they have. But each night there's major concerts at the London Philharmonic. There's themed concerts. It might be Mark Hudson with, uh, Denny Lane with Joey Mullen doing a show with right. special guests. And then the next night might be, uh, a tribute to Wings. And it's nothing but Wings material for the entire night. Every year they come up with different concerts concert events right. so that along with all the day sightseeing and all the day activities there's always great things to do at night it's a plug but if anyone hasn't been to to liverpool whether you go on your own or with another tour group or with me go go there you got to go once in your life mm -hmm. um yeah mm -hmm. i've had people just step you know step onto the P penny lane streets or or see the gates of strawberry fields and just break down crying. I mean, it, it happened to me involuntarily there. It happened to me in Israel when I was at the Western Wall. You don't know why these things happen, but mm. it overcomes you. It's probably a lifetime of love for the Beatles. And then when you're at these places, um, like John's home or Paul's mm. home, which we go inside, it really pow, it hits you and you get that great feeling. And, uh, you know, you know what? It, it's maybe the culmination of a, a lifetime of loving the Beatles music and them as people. And then, and, and, and then you're, when you're in their home, it, it really has a great effect. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's really true. I mean, like, like all of us, um, you know, as a kid, I read all of the biographies that had come out, you know, Julius Fast and Anthony Scaduto. And mm. then, you know, I mean, even before the Hunter Davies and, you know, and they, and they're all describing, Strawberry Field and Penny Lane and John's house and Paul's yeah. house and the neighborhoods. But, you know, and I have a pretty good imagination, but somehow getting on site and seeing it, it's completely different than you imagine. You know, it's you because I guess you bring whatever 
whatever your own feeling about a town like Liverpool theoretically might be, but, but seeing it in person, it was every, every single thing was a bit different than, than I had imagined, even though I'd seen pictures, you know? Mm. So yeah, I, I, I agree. Everyone should go. (laughs) And in some, and in some ways, I don't know if it was better to have gone in the eighties when a lot of it was imagination Mm. and Liverpool was, I don't want to use the word seedier, but a lot more gray yeah. Uh, a lot more, um, uh, maybe the, sweet, the streets weren't as well swept. And now you go there and Liverpool won, which is by the docks. It's, it's uh, as, as fancy and as high class and as cultural as any s- metropolitan city in the world. I mean, you, you wouldn't recognize it if you went in 1983 and then went back in 2013. Right. When, when Liverpool celebrated its, its birthday and when it would be, was the cultural capital of the world yeah. it really just it metamorphosed overnight it became you know a real cosmopolitan high class city and and it still is that but yet it retains its old charm because the salt of the people the the, the people are still liverpudlians and they'll still tell it like it is and you can see where lennon got his wit and Paul got his savvy, and Ringo got his humor. You still see it because uh, it's in the people. And that's what I always said was my favorite thing about Liverpool. Yeah, of course, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields and the Beatles' home. But the people themselves, I mean, the stories you get when you walk down the streets where they filmed, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, uh, even in London, even the places they filmed The Hard Day's Night or Help Mm -hmm. and near Twickenham Studios, when the people come out and tell their stories about when the Beatles were filming in those places. Hmm. The great thing is is to hear those stories and experience it firsthand and getting that feeling that you get when you see these places that you've always dreamed about and you see them for the first time. It's really special. Oh, that magic feeling. Uh (laughs) Yeah, really. Really? You reminded me just now of one of my my treasured memories of when I went to Liverpool. Uh, I was on a bus tour, and we stopped in front of the Empress Pub, which is where the front cover of the Sentimental Journey album from Ringo was taken. And there was a boy who drove by in his his, uh, bicycle, and he looked like, you know, teenager with a cap on, kind of like the same kind of cap that John had on in The Hard Day's Night. And he stopped in front of me, and he said, Ringo Starr used to live in, mate. <laughs> and he drove off. <laughs> so very friendly and personable. Just, I always love that. That's you know, great because yeah. a lot of the times we'll drive up in our you know, yellow magical mystery tour bus and we'll pull up on that block and we'll all take pictures of the Empress Pub. And uh, P- locals will come up and go, why are you taking pictures of this rundown bar? Uh-huh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, hello, it's the cover, and we'll whip out the photo. It's the cover of the album. There's this has this has sentimental reasons to us, right? <laughs> um, let's just go back a little bit to Danbury Fields. You were talking about some of the special guests that you're going to have there. Mm. Tell the folks who Shannon is because she's an amazing artist. Mm. Tell, tell the folks more about her. Well, that's a good segue because uh, she had a lot to do with Liverpool. She's been coming over as an artist for many years and is the unofficial official uh, art artist of Liverpool. She designed all the rooms at the Hard Day's Night Hotel mm. and she designs the um, images for the uh, Beatles convention. It's always her artwork and if anyone's seen Shannon's artwork, you, you know how great it is. It's like real life. You look doesn't know, you don't know you're looking at an airbrushed piece of art. It looks like an actual photo yeah. and uh, We've had the pleasure of uh, having Shannon design our event logo for um, Danbury Fields Forever now for the fourth year. She also comes to the events where she does her artwork on the spot. And the past couple of years, she's also, a lot of people don't know, is she's a great musician. Mm-hmm. And she's jumped on stage and jammed with uh, some of the bands. And uh, one of the per- people she would jam with a lot was a gentleman by the name of Dennis Ferrante, mm-hmm. who was uh, John Lennon's engineer, a Grammy Award winning uh, engineer and producer. And he passed, uh, you know, within the past year, he passed away. And we're dedicating this year's show to him and to Sid Bernstein. Mm -hmm. Dennis, of course, because he's been to our events and he's been a special guest and a dear friend. And Sid, who was uh, like, like, you know, like an uncle to me for so many years and such a dear and wonderful, sweet fellow. And if it wasn't for him, who knows? Would there have been a Carnegie Hall or a Shea? You know, would the Beatles have exploded the way they did? You know, he's 
definitely a part of the Beatles history. And with him not being here and us doing a 50th anniversary tribute to the Shea Stadium show, definitely had to dedicate the event to him. Yeah, it's such an honor for me to meet those two gentlemen and to interview them. And Dennis, in particular, was so supportive of my shows mm -hmm. through the years. And a guest went out when he was on my show in New Jersey on WDHA. Oh, wow. And, in fact, the last show I did there was with Dennis and May Pang together. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Um, you also have a special guest and someone that we've had here on our show on Things We Said Today, and that's Candy Leonard. We have two authors. We have uh, Vicka Winters, and we also have Candy Leonard. And Candy has written uh, the Beatleness book, mm -hmm. and uh, she'll be they'll they'll be there to have their books. You know, you can get them autographed and get them signed and get uh, you know a copy of their books. They'll be there, and it's really Shannon, the two authors, and Hilton Valentine is our very special guest of honor, for, of course, from the Animals. But, you know, they're they're hanging out. They're not there, you know, with long lines and, you know, here's the book next, do -do -do, here's the next, do -do -do. you know, they're not there as um, robots signing books and moving on. They're there to hang out and have fun and listen to the music. And the setting is such that where the bands are playing, even if you're visiting the vendors or you're grabbing bite to eat or if the kids are on um some of the rides you know there there's there's like the carnival rides there or you're visiting the vendors you're still hearing the music because it's a band shell and it's such a beautiful setting that no matter where you are you're still hearing the beatles music coming from the stage mm. can we give the website for the uh sure. Danbury fields for music sure. festival? absolutely so it's www fab four music festival and it's fab the number four uh, not spelled out, Fab Four Music Festival. And that lists the lineup. It lists all the guests. You know, people want to stay over if they're traveling from, you know, anywhere. Uh, Danbury is very, very close proximity to New York and Jersey. It's, you know, traveling distance from all of New England. There's a hotel offering, I think, $79 overnight uh, accommodations right nearby. And then mm -hmm. we're going to have a Beatles party late night. So when the event ends at 8 o'clock at Ives Concert Park in Danbury, We'll all head over to the hotel and have a sing-along and uh, continue the fun there. Okay. Cool. And also, this is a minor thing, but I'm I'm one of the MCs. Uh, I'm no, one of the MCs for the show. You think you are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I've heard Al. I've heard Al, and I've heard Steve. You are out of the box. <laughs> okay. You got the hook. Uh-oh. Okay. You so, three are taking my it's, place, it's then. It's all in jest. Um, I'm honored that... Uh, Ken Michaels and Gary Thoreau of Rewound Radio are our official MCs. I used to MC all the shows myself in the day when we'd have conventions and all that. Um, but as I'm losing my voice over the years <laughs> and as I, there's so many other things to run around and do, I, I finally found someone who's I can trust, who I know is going to keep the things moving and, and add humor and add trivia and make the crowd happy. And Ken just does a great job. You guys would be proud of him. Mm. He's mm -hmm. great having him as our MC for the fourth year in a row. It's been fun the last four years. I get a blast out of it. I really do, just to see the different generations of people come there and enjoy the show. You, you get to see new Beatle fans being yeah, introduced to the music. Of course. And like, like we said, all the different types of Beatle bands spanning through the years. And, uh, you know, different approaches in the tributes. So I like that aspect of it. So uh, any last questions, guys? Come on, Al Sussman, you've got to give me one. Okay, well, let me ask you, uh, actually, this is, a, this is an, uh, an, old, an, uh, an old memory, not a, and not a particularly happy memory either. But I know we've okay. talked about it at some point. One of your first conventions in Boston yes. was in December of 1980. Yeah, right? right after. Tell us about right that. Right after we lost John. Right, tell us about that. Wow. So the question was, does the show go on or not? Um, I was a consultant for that, and I was the uh, MC for the event. And it was a company in Boston called Nostalgia Productions. And they'd been promoting it for a year. And they had the old Bradford Hotel as the venue, which is where the conventions were when Joe Pope did them in the mid-70s. Uh -huh. And this was, uh -huh. you know, we had the bands, we had the – everything was in place. And John, you know, passes. And then what do we do? And we thought it would be – is the word cathargic? We thought it would be more important to have the event and so people can commiserate – could be together and to have a shared experience and to celebrate – not his passing, of course not, but to celebrate his life. And we went on with the show, and it was a very heavy, I mean, it was a tough, tough show to produce. 
but it had its own special feeling. No event, no convention has ever, you know, been that, had that kind of an element to it. And, uh, anyone who was at it walked away, you know, knowing they were at something special. But, you know, I'll tell you what, I would rather not have that feeling and that not have happened. I'd rather have been just a lesser attended, unimportant Boston Beatle convention than what it turned out to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and imagine all the other Beatle conventions that happened not shortly after that uh -huh. and how difficult it was for everyone who put those together. Yeah, right. That's of for course. sure. Yeah. All right. Well, Charles, it has been a blast to have you here on the show. Uh, next time, try to do it from your home. <laughs> <laughs> we will figure it out. Steve and I are going to spend the next 364 days working on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay so once again it's danbury fields forever it is on august the 15th at the charles ive center in danbury connecticut if you want more information you go to the website www.fab4musicfestival.com and the website for the beetle tours is uh, liverpooltours.com and they can always call i mean we have someone who answers the phones all the time at 203-795- Four seven three seven. I'm I'm usually the one answering the phone. Mm hmm And Fab Four Music Festival. The four is the number. Correct. Thank you. Okay. So, thanks so much for joining us. I look forward to being with you. And well, by the time this posts, <laughs> it's going to be in about a week. Great. So we hope to see as many people there as possible. And uh, and guys, uh, now that I'm with Ken and I'm in his office and I'm recording this with the studio. I'm going to move in here. No, you are not. <laughs> that chance of that. <laughs> you are dreaming, pal. <laughs> All right. This has been so much fun. Thank you, Charles, for being here. Thank you. And on behalf of Steve Marinucci... Alan Cozen and Al Sussman. This is Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. Thanking all of you for listening. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.